Hello, hello. Aloha, Nui Loa, everyone, wherever you are. California, Canada, Maui, Texas, East Coast, Midwest. Don't North forget Coast. to take the time to um, say hi to everybody <laughs> with your eyes. <laughs> Australia. Mm. Wonderful to see you all. It's always uh, wonderful to see you. Mm. Wow, this is so much fun. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Lucky us. Vermont. Mm. Kyoto. Okay. Grants Pass. Pen. Mm. So it's so good to come together and uh, get to be in silence and quiet, meditating together, and then the talk, question and answers. So. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> hey, Ben. <laughs> so Steve will uh, lead the sitting now and I'm muting myself. <laughs> We've been using mostly eye consciousness, thought consciousness, memory recognition. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. So maybe beginning just aware of seeing, eyes open or closed, it doesn't matter. You'll see that Eyes closed, there's at least uh, you know, patterns and figures and geometry happening behind the eyelids. Or sometimes when we close our eyes, if we're more visual thinkers, we'll, we'll have a lot of mental imagery, even if our attention is focused at the eye door with the eyes closed. And we hold that awareness and open our eyes, there's, there still may be visual level thinking with the eyes open. Even if you scan softly, the soft eyes of the beginner's mind. And then bringing the attention into settle right there at the eye door sensitivity calling up the clear comprehension that the actuality and what's happening are these light particles, light waves coming into contact with the eye sensitivity. In the very moment of the contact, a number of things happen. First, we would probably notice seeing, seeing consciousness. And then we may not always notice, but it's always there, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone. And then any other following thoughts with that. And this is how we're beginning our meditation. as I give the kids some privacy in the backyard.
recognizing that the eye, the eye door and eye consciousness, like ear door and ear consciousness, are the body. They're not separate from the body. They're a feature of the body. So with that clear comprehension, that clear understanding, sampajanya in the Pali, to see where your instinct goes of opening up to the entire field of bodily experience, which might be a, like a snapshot of a global bodily awareness from within the body, as well as feeling the outer contours, the shapes and forms of the sitting body, standing, lying, and then internalizing this body consciousness with its mindful awareness to feel the particulars of the sensation, patches of pressure, areas of tingling, or energy streams, hard, soft, lightness, pressure, vibration, or as some, uh, some of us like to do sometimes, we go to a touchstone, like the folded hands or the hands on our thighs, or the feet, magnificent receptors and expressors of sensation. And then last but not least, right at the mind door of the solar plexus. Sometimes that would be a meditation anchor Saira Upandita would offer just to rest there knowing the physical sensation of the area of the solar plexus, the physical uh, component of consciousness or of, of consciousness itself. The consciousness arising here at the solar plexus is different than the consciousness that notices sights, sounds, sensations, fragrances, and so forth, and thoughts. But it is here at the solar plexus, mind door, heart mind door, where we most clearly notice th thoughts in their, in their nature as momentary raindrop-like formations that reflect present, past, future, our imagination, as fleeting as raindrops. So if we seem to catch one, it's already disappearing. So perhaps it's a sense of stepping back a little bit and noticing the entire field of rain, of thoughts, thought formations, or sometimes the underlying emotion or mental state that might be the proximate cause of the particular kinds of thoughts we're having in the moment imagining, planning, remembering, reflecting. And generally it's an easy scan of the, f the field of play in the pasture of the mind and thought formations. We're not looking to specify well, what is this exactly? Am I imagining or remembering? It doesn't matter. 
what matters is just that moment's contact of present time awareness, touching, that thought moment. But then just seeing what happens, relaxing, not holding on, nothing to hold on to. And settling when you feel so settled into what may be your anchor for this sitting, the body, the breath, perhaps at the abdomen where you feel the rise and fall or expansion, contraction, the play of sensations that roll around as the abdomen rises or expands and as it collapses or falls. And we're not, we're not after anything at all in particular. At times, rhythms become apparent and we feel the rhythmic nature of the breath. At other times, very fine points of sensation become apparent. Either one can be a portal into understanding the nature of anicca, impermanence, or dukkha, the slipperiness of impermanence in that it doesn't it doesn't hold up as a reliable and stable security. So we see the dukkha nature of the body-mind. And at yet other times we see in all these sensations and patterns and raindrops alighting on a still ocean, There's no agency there. There's no singular controlling entity, force. Just conditions coming together from all around. With rain, it's air temperature, water temperature, currents, uh, night or day, sun or moon. All those play a part in how the raindrops particulate and become what they finally become for just a moment and disappear again back into the ocean from whence they came. So with great respect and great care and trusting that the body reveals everything that we need to know about experience and about ourselves. Lean back in this moment and make the awareness available to the experience that appears through the six sense doors. alighting with the unique natures when they're apparent, ultimately, most importantly, to the underlying behavior and the changeability and the emptiness of self. The ever-moving flow of life.
Thank you, Stephen. And uh, just Michelle, before you go on, I just want to, I have to sign off right now. Um, so I'll, Michelle, you'll be the host and they should be able to unmute themselves for questions at this point. Fine. Um, if folks remember about a year ago, we had um, uh, Jake Davis and uh, colleague Puakea Noglemeyer translated the um, Karaniya Metta Sutta into the Hawaiian language. And then um, a Kumuhula here, um, Kekuhi Kealii Kanaka Ole um, did the voicing of that chant. And she this week is running um, like a Hawaiian Oli workshop um, for students of hers like all around the world. And she invited me to come do a workshop on Buddhist chanting um, from our lineage. So I'm going to go do that. And I just realized well, I've, we've never actually offered something like that for our own community. <laughs> so it, it inspired me to, to, to think about that. And maybe sometime in this, this, these coming months, we can do a little, um, you know, not part of the Sunday sitting, but maybe a little separate program around chanting, the Paritta chanting. So take care, everyone. Happy holidays, and we'll see you next weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah. Ah, so um, thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Jesse. Have fun. <laughs> hmm. I think it's um, probably very difficult to come up with a Christmas carol in recent times, but in a Charlie Brown Christmas, they have a very recent Christmas carol. And the last, um, the last stanza, <clears throat> the lyric is, uh, oh, that we could always see such spirit in the year. So just kind of thinking about December and there's so many different traditions of um, celebrating uh, spirit in December in the year. Um, and I think it's really a beautiful way to end a carol that, oh, we, oh, that we could always see such spirit in the year. So my talk is just a little bit about that that is actually possible <laughs> within ourselves to um, remember that spirit of the holidays in December. So I think that just that way in which I'll just em emphasize certain things, but just in kind of generally, if we look at this month and the different traditions, there is such a the sense of, of um, not just honoring, say, something like generosity or love, goodwill, right, peace, like the joy, that these, these um, qualities, these spiritual qualities, there's a way we honor them, celebrate them, but also access them, really make space in our lives to access them. Um, so just to mention, of course, that... Um, this month is the solstice, right? The, the longest, it's the longest night of the year in a few days, uh, the shortest amount of sunlight, the longest amount of darkness. And we, we just have to remember that there's a reason why these celebrations and holidays come. And, and to just, again, keep in mind that um, for many, many uh, years, humans did not have electricity. Right. And so um, I think that relationship, the relationship with the sun actually was very personal. It wasn't abstract in any way, shape or form. So just in terms of being able to see, to see, to have enough light, to see, to have um, warmth, to have uh, food, you know, that that relationship to the sun was so significant in terms of knowing our life depends upon it and all of life depends upon it that that 
that the depth of this of this time the that that sense of um the conception and birth of the sun every year that seasonal birth is um underneath everything right in terms of this time of year um so that that i think the depth of the gratitude right that that um is meant to the understanding of that, uh, that, that it's meant to um, help us access, right? To, to remember that. Uh, and so I think that that, um, there's a poem by Basho who lived in 1644 to 1694 in Japan a lot of his spiritual tradition was long difficult pilgrimages you know in the 1600s that was spiritual pilgrimages very intense and hard uh, and this poem he wrote um, at dawn after a snowfall but this, uh, this the sun came out in the morning in the scent of plums Suddenly the sun peeps out, the mountain path. I mean, he could have said that many different ways, but it's like in the scent of blossoms, the sun comes out. So there's a the sense of smelling and seeing, and it, it's very simple, but it, it really has that flavor of um, not just the the warmth of the sun uh, and how important that is. But also I think we have to see that as a metaphor for awakening, right? Whenever, whenever we're really lost in thought and not paying attention and there is some glimmer of a witness, a witnessing awareness that appears in our mind. I think when we first really started to grasp that possibility of the quality of awareness in our own, that we can access that, that it's inside of us, that that's the same thing, that the sunlight, the, the metaphor for the sunlight in that way, and that um, in our early times of practice, how, how hard it was to access that, even the witness, witnessing our movements, witnessing our thoughts, witnessing our body sensations, that that um, can feel just like the sun coming out after a long period of it not being out. Oh, just a sec. <laughs> oh, the plug to my bat, my the plug to my computer uh, had dropped out. So it, it, I got a warning that my computer was just about to go off. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be okay. Um, so this, this again, this kind of time of year, and, and I think that there's so much that gets commercial and so much that gets busy. Uh, and and I think that of, uh, I think all of us really try to bring the um, teachings, the teachings, uh, to heart at this time because it's really about accessing and creating sacred space, not only ourselves or, and together, like sitting together now. And, and I think that um, the loving kindness. You know, you can move from that gratitude for the warmth and light of the sun and the winter and um, the dependence, that, that important dependence we have. And then, of course, that can elicit a lot of generosity of the wish to share our, our well-being with others um, in whatever way we do. That, that the loving kindness is a way in which we access um, goodwill. We access um, good tidings, goodwill, our goodness. Uh, and the, the way the Buddha taught it was to start with ourselves. 
of course we can start with anything and i think that important the way we share the love and kindness teachings is to start where you can so if you can start with a stone in your backyard you start there right you start you see where where is their connection where can i find connection if it's with um jupiter or venus or the sun or uh, a toad or like but but also ourselves it's like we we start to understand that um, one finds this access, again, it's access to a friendship with all beings, with ourselves, but also with our thoughts, with anger, with sadness, with happiness, with joy. You're getting a relationship, again, that relationship, that participatory relationship with anything that appears of kindness. Um, And that this accessing of this goodness or goodwill uh, is, is actually, um, I think all of us know that place where we'll feel a kindness and um, it softens the mind. It softens the heart so that we can be with things as they are. As Steve was saying that like the just just with seeing pleasant, unpleasant, neutral with thought, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, that things as they are include pain, include pleasure, include neutral, that that ability to be with that, to be and to be genuinely interested in life as it is with the pain in the body, pain in the heart, pain in the mind or pain in someone you're living with or down the street or across the earth or the pleasure the neutral that that ability to get a relationship with how things are the wisdom practice that the that this it's so important i think again to look at this time of year and to see that all the um, qualities of sacred space are emphasized creating sacred space of the generosity, the kindness, and then the peace, the relationship with how things are, the genuine interest and being with things as they are, as they are, the peace, are all in this um, time of year to be um, valued, expressed. I was um, thinking about one of my early teachers, Deepama from India, um, in relationship to this time of year, because she just, um, she had access to loving kindness and peace, which can often seem like it's hard to always reconcile the, the, those two paths, those two truths of existence. But um, even if the TV was on and a lot of people were talking in the room, and I think that's what really touched me about Deepama, even if it was chaos, <laughs> she could just like shower anybody with the most intense loving kindness, like a shower, it would be like, and it would, if it didn't matter if it was her grandson or somebody just walking in or her daughter or somebody, again, she didn't know it was the, it was the same quality. It was unconditional of the loving kindness. But I also could see her just sit down and access Nibbana like that. <laughs> Like, you know, and I'm very sensitive kinesthetically. I could feel what she was doing. And I was like, wow, just like, how does she even do that? Like unconditional love, unconditional peace. And for me, she was like a lighthouse of like, this is possible. This is possible. She's a lay woman. This is possible. She's got her grandson running around screaming and the her daughter has a TV on she's accessing it it's possible not dependent on conditions it's okay that we have to create the conditions to find enough <laughs> quiet you know 
to, to practice. And, um, but you can see that then we integrate it into going to the grocery store, right? You integrate it into an argument with somebody. You integrate it. You keep trying to integrate accessing that ability to witness, to be genuinely interest, interested. And as Steve said at the, the instructions today, to connect and see what happens to connect with what's happening, with what's appearing, no matter what it is, and just see what happens. See what happens without trying to get anything, without trying to get rid of anything. <clears throat> this is uh, from Basho. I particularly like his winter poems. Again, he's, he's on a long, long, hard journey, and it's winter. First winter shower. The monkey also seems to want a small raincoat. First winter shower. The monkey also seems to want a small raincoat. There's no distinction here between the monkey and a human being. Friendship, tomo, kinship, metta. So this, the loving kindness, that goodwill toward all, right? The, um, learning to have this sense of kinship and stewardship. Again, with whether it's a star or whether it's um, an ant, it's whether it's a thought, whether it's um, somebody next door screaming, you know, whatever it is that's coming up with that's appearing, that we get that relational kind quality to um, what we're learning to access. And that can be the spirit of the year, the spirit of the pandemic. <laughs> I, heard, I read this thing that I thought was pretty, I, I think humor is so important uh, that in London, people were singing, <clears throat> um, it's beginning to look a lot like last Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's so awesome you know it's like well <laughs> we got another year of the pandemic you know and it's just like whatever we can do to like lighten up and just kind of get over it like okay here we are you know again a year later okay do what we can to steward to steward to take care to face things as they are to be with things as they are, peace. And the Buddha taught that it's the resistance to what's happening that's the suffering, most of the suffering. And I notice, you know, in this, uh, just as, as, as the things are kind of, you know, going into another, aspect of the pandemic that the when we shift over to um, the mindfulness practice the liberation practice to the to the unconditional acceptance practice i think that um that the definition of mindfulness as soft readiness is so important that because it gives us the chance to pivot because that's what the times are calling for Every, every moment is uncertain. Every moment is changing. It's like that moment to moment, sixth sense door awareness that that ability to drop in and just get within a few minutes of mindfulness practice that every moment is changing, right? That every, it's so in flux. And it's, it's not just um, changing so fast, but it's minuscule. 
it's a sight, it's a taste, it's a sound, it's a thought, it's a, an emotion, it's a body sensation. They're like just going so fast and they're so minuscule, these moments. Um, and the ability to just pivot and pivot and pivot is really being called for now. I know I went to um, be with Stephen uh, as he had surgery in Honolulu, which went really, really well, everybody, just so you know, if you were wondering, um, it was great, you know, and um, I had so many experiences in the hospital, but <laughs> I don't, I don't, Steve, I don't even think you know what this happened, but when you were taken away um, to go to surgery, um, there was a piece of paper that um, I was supposed to give the doctor, but the doctor didn't come and I had gone down to the bottom of the elevator and realized I had the paper. So I didn't even quite know, remember where I was supposed to go, but I went up and was to another floor and was looking around and it wasn't the right floor. So I, I was standing by this elevator um, for a really long time. And so this doctor had come by once and <laughs> came by me again. And each time we made eye contact through the mask, right? And said hi, and three times. And the fourth time she went by and she said, um, do you know that this elevator is out of order? <laughs> like, wow, thanks for telling me, right? But it was like, you know, there was no sign on it. There was nothing, you know, this is a really small example, but it felt like almost like my whole trip was like that. Like when I got back to the airport in Honolulu, everything was changed. It's like they changed all the way that um, international and domestic, they put it in all one room and it's like they had all new people. Um, my favorite part is they had all new people training as uh, like so, it was so crowded. So many people were going through and they kept taking people's bags aside because that's what the new people were um, doing. And they didn't tell them, no, you don't really have to do that. So there was this immense pile up like <laughs> just and you know you know if you don't you know you're sort of wondering am I going to make my flight and I I was it was so long maybe 45 minutes and I still hadn't gotten my bag so finally I got my bag and this man who'd worked there many years um he looked at me and he said I said, you know, just, I just would be interesting to know. I didn't know, we didn't know why this was happening. And I said, just, could you tell me why? <laughs> like, why this is happening? And he said, oh yes, we have all new people training. And he said, we really, we really have to be patient. <laughs> and I wanted to say, actually, <laughs> I really don't have to be patient. <laughs> But I'm going to try. I keep trying, but it was really funny. It was like, um, it seemed like every place I went, they even um, moved a bathroom. Like, I, this, like they took a bathroom away where there used to be a bathroom. And again, it felt like, um, I don't know, maybe it's not like that in your life, but sort of wherever I've been and whatever I've been doing lately, that sort of feels like, it's like, oh, the bathroom's gone. Oh, oh. I was going to get some water. Starbucks is closed, right? Like, like, oh, it's like, oh, 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 you know, it's amazing. Um, I do think it's going to um, probably continue like that a bit. So here we are. Holiday season. What can we access, right? Like, what can we access in this uncertainty and change? And it's like that, that sense again of soft readiness the readiness for anything to happen because that's the truth. Oh, yeah, oh, pivot, pivot, pivot. Where am I? Okay. I um, didn't have time to get a booster. I'm not kind of talking about whether one should or not, but I just have wanted to get one for quite a while. And I did get one Friday. Uh, but for me, it's usually a, uh, the last two vaccines, it's been a three week long, <clears throat> difficult recovery from them. Um, and so I'm uh, just going to tell you one more story because I've had so many lately, but I was driving back from getting the booster 
Um, <laughs> and I heard on the radio, this, I'm not kidding. I heard on the radio, um, if you got a booster today, it's too late. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. You know, it's just like kind of here we are on that roll of just like whatever happens, happens. But I just think it's so funny. It's like, why would they tell somebody that? You know, it's like it's, they could have said it's kind of late. You know, it's like probably, you know, you might have like catch something, but to say it's totally too late, I thought it was like this, this really is um the world has gotten so odd right it's just so odd and i'm not sure maybe you, none of you are noticing that it's getting a little odder as the time is going on but i do think again it's like i find it um that shifting back into humor especially if you're not that patient to type <laughs> really helps you know of course patience or or being aware of impatience that's really, you know, that's really the teaching is like Vipassana is being right with what's happening. So if acceptance isn't happening and resistance is happening, of course, we value resistance. We're impartial. It's like we're not trying to get back to acceptance. What's happening now is resistance. And it's whatever the experience is, you try to be with the physical sensations, notice the thoughts coming and going. And to be careful of rejecting the storyline or getting um, caught in the storyline, because the storyline is a clue to what's happening. We don't know if something is fear or anger or happiness or joy, usually if we don't notice a storyline, but the storyline is meant to be the clue to go, oh, right, planning, planning number 2,225,000 thought, then we know, oh, maybe there's a little anxiety under this, right? Like, it's like, you, you have to recognize the thoughts. Because I'll often hear this, this practice taught is, you know, don't pay attention to the story, just go to the body. And it's like, of course, you have to get the clue and then if you go to the body, sometimes you don't, sometimes you don't get the clue. And often we go to the body before we get the clue. It's not a rigid system. It's a flexible system. You shift to body no, or notice thoughts coming and going, but eventually it's like getting, oh, I can be with this experience without getting totally lost in the storyline. I hope you see the difference because that, that's part of this the flexibility of this practice. We're not trying to get rid of thought. We're trying to discern it. This is all about a relationship of discernment. Um, we don't need the thought once we get the clue. Then we can just allow joy to come and go by itself with getting, without getting attached. Or we can allow fear to come and go by itself without getting um, caught in the object of the fear. So the wisdom practice, um, if we look at the the which I love, the factors of enlightenment, the factors of awakening. They often talk about what brightens, lightens, or brightens the mind. It's like that moment when we're lost in our experience and we start to witness it. That's that experience of like lightening or brightening the mind. Um, the um, next factor after mindfulness is investigation. And that just to bring up very lightly, I'm talking about these very lightly, but the, the next sixth after the mindfulness, um, investigation, courageous energy, joyful interest, um, they're energizing. And calm, concentration, equanimity are meant to be calming or tranquilizing. Even when we like contemplate that, that um, they're meant to be um, cultivated, accessed over time, so that um, when all seven are present, um, it's it's considered a moment of awakening. 
And just one moment of that is so powerful. It's like um, the there's a word that I think we have to be very careful of, but the word whole, W-H-O-L-E, when those seven are present, there's one moment of wholeness. It's like we comprehend, not through the thought process, but we comprehend fully one moment. And the, the, there are many examples given, but it's, it's like if you look at a, a raindrop, or you look at a puddle that like when it's very still, the whole world is reflected in that drop. That's what this is, the seven factors are there and the, there's a, um, a complete presence. The, the energies are in balance, the energized and the calm. And so if you look again, investigation is that ability to, it's really a question. It's, it's usually a question like when we take a step or when we hear a sound or we, hear, we look at a thought or any of it, it's not to go through the thought process, to know that the next moment is truly new, is, is, is unknown, and also not to um, pounce or plunge onto an experience, but really understand that if you understand the next moment is like a petal opening on a flower, it's very delicate. It's, it's, there's a sense of um, um, letting a moment emerge or unfold as it is without a, a word description of it. So the word bell or the word bird or the word elbow <laughs> or the word pain or the word pleasure, any of it, it's like the word might come the thought about it might come, but then you come back to the direct experience. So you can see that like that soft readiness, oops, somebody else, seven factors, I'll name them again. Yeah, so the, um, the soft readiness leads to kind of being able to kind of have that, it's, it, it's not a big question, it's almost like an awe, A-W-E, or a wonder, like what is this? What is going on really? free from the past idea. It's really free from memory. It's new, 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 new. One moment, all it takes is one moment of like letting the, it's like a dropping in versus staying up in the thought, dropping in versus staying up in the thought. And then, of course, um, what's beautiful, it's, it's not always linear, but there's that sense when it's described linear, linearly, it's that courage. It's the courage it takes to stay with that process of not going back up and describing it like, oh, that's a bird, and just we know it, and that's it. I've, I know what it is. And we kind of kill it, right? We don't, we don't explore it. We don't investigate it. We don't allow it to emerge wordlessly and gently. That can be done with the most severe pain or I'm having amazing brain fog right now. And if I was identified with it, I wouldn't try to give a talk. <laughs> it's so foggy, but I, why well, identify with it, right? It's not me, it's not mine, it's not I, right? And that's like the whole, anything, anything that appears, we can either think it's mine or not mine. That's all part of investigation. I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this, but that you stay with it, that you have the courage to stay with it. And then sometimes, sometimes uh, there's what appears a joyful interest, a genuine interest, a joyful, it's joyful because you're interested in pain, pleasure, or neutral. So it's considered joyful because you've broken the pleasure pain barrier. So you're interested in pain, pleasure, neutral. You're interested in anger as well as joy. You're interested in peace as well as aversion. You're interested in, in it all, genuinely. You're not forcing it. And then it's just remembering the Buddha taught that this joyful interest is the gateway into awakening. Joy, this kind of joy is a gateway. I love that. It's the door. 
And then the calm, of course, I think most of us know nowadays calm, what that feels like again, you know, um, I always think of it as just like when a refrigerator is really loud and buzzing and it goes off. That's, there's that calm. Or, you know, a, a more gross example would be when a jackhammer is going off ne next door or, you know, down the street and it goes off, right? It's that uh, something relaxes, something gets calm. Um, I noticed Stephen's been really emphasizing that lately because it's like our nervous systems tend to be so overstimulated in that sense of it is like the refrigerator going off or the jackhammer, something the nervous system relaxes. There's ability to concentrate, like to be with the beginning, middle, end of a breath or a sound, or you can connect and sustain the attention with something. Right now, it could be with the, your hands. Just connect and sustain the attention with the hands and a breath. You can feel it can just calm the system, relax the attention, and come to a deeper stillness just like the puddle or the, the raindrop gets more still, we can see more clearly. And then the equanimity, lastly, is that impartiality. So in that flow of awareness, whatever appears pain, pleasant, neutral, um, we have that flexibility to value the experience no matter what it is. So yeah, just to mention again that mindfulness, the investigation, courageous energy, the joyful interest, the calm, concentration, equanimity, that, that ability to um, access that is possible for all of us. And, it, and instead of thinking it should be all day, try it for one moment, you know, or we get pieces. Sometimes we might be working with um, calm for three years or investigation for 10 years. It's, it's like sometimes we're cultivating one and it doesn't seem the, like the others are cult, being cultivated, but they are, they're just more subtle. So I think that um, we get a increasing sensitivity to how things are and we, we, we start to um, wanna be less identified with our experience or hold on to our experience uh, on the way of peace, you know, the, on the way of kindness, we get uh, less identified, less suffering, more peace. Um, so I'm gonna end with a Basho poem about that kind of stillness and that fullness of comprehension or like the fullness of understanding of, of peace. The stillness seeping into the rocks, cicadas speech. So in this holiday time, you know, may we um, enjoy the spirit of all of us celebrating and valuing the um, generosity, the kindness, the joy, and the peace. That we can access all year round. So it's uh, time for questions.
Um, I assume you'll be able to go down to the reaction button on the bottom of the screen and raise your hand um, and uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Is it okay? Yeah, and I let's wait a minute. Maybe um, I'm not sure quite where Steve went, but I'll wait till he gets back, unless it's long. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Anaya. Are you calling me? Yep, Anaya. 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 Yeah. Ananya. Ananya. Thank you, Michelle. I would love to hear those seven factors again, please. Yep. Uh, mindfulness, okay. sati, investigation, mm -hmm. courage, energy or viria, courageous energy. Mm -hmm. Joyful interest. Calm, concentration, and equanimity. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank you. Harry? Yeah, um, I was really struck by when you were talking about Deepa Ma accessing loving kindness and wisdom with the television on and kids and all of that. It really, really speaks to me. And I, I, I had a thing that happened, it might be worth sharing. Um, I'm taking these spinning classes again. I haven't done it for a while. It's a real push. And so I got about two thirds, it's an hour class. And I got about two thirds of the way through and I'm thinking, how much more do I have to do? This is excruciating, what am I doing? She's killing me, blah, 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 blah. And I switched to something like this that you, you taught me something like this years ago. I went into cycling, not in that sense, but hearing, seeing, cycling, touching, where hearing was just perceiving the music and the shouting and all of that coming into my ears seeing was just a vague kind of view of what's going on cycling was uh, the movement that was going on and, and touching was uh, against the seat or against the pedals and everything and all of that suffering that i've been creating by wondering what when is it going to end or why is it this and that at least for a time dissipated and i did it for a while and i, I just and then the, the class was over so thank you again for that teaching and, and thank you for was saying once again, as you have over and over, that if Deepa Ma can do it in, in chaos, any of us can do it whatever we can, maybe not at that level, but we can do something. Thank you. I'm sure uh, Steve might have something to add, but I, I just wanted to mention that that teaching of those four things that you just mentioned, um, actually came out of the forest tradition in Burma. Tangpulu Sayadaw taught that, and he was a forest monk. And um, the way he taught it was uh, when, you, when you're out walking, because the forest monks are you know, out in the forest walking, he'd be, he'd be aware of seeing. Like Steve started us, right, in the instructions today, the seeing. And you can do it for, you know, you can do it for five seconds. It's however long your attention sustains it. So it could be five or 10 seconds, or it could be five minutes or longer it, it, seeing and then hearing. And then, like you said, in the, in the walking, you do the legs moving and then the bottom of your feet. And it's, um, it's very, I find it, and sometimes I add knowing. So sometimes I add five. I do five rather than four, knowing, just a general knowing. Um, I think it's really, 
as you just described, it just helps, it helps um, break that I'm going for a walk and it's going to take this much time or, you know, walking meditation is too hard to sustain or cycling, whatever is too hard to sustain when you, when you actually um, add that in, um, it's, it actually usually becomes interesting or at least not <laughs> boring. <laughs> Oh, Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything with it, but it's such a powerful practice, you know. I think Harry should start his own course. Ah. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> hey, I was late for meditation because I was watching the football game. So if that's his own thing. <laughs> anyway. Well, um, there you go. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the football game on in the midst of the chaos. We can do it. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> I try and practice during the game, and I try and note wanting and fear and all of this. And by the time I get to about the third quarter, I do pretty well. By the time I get to the third quarter, I'm just screaming and yelling, "What did you do?" And I'm totally reactive, you know. So, I guess I'll know when I'm really making progress if I can get through a whole game without getting totally hooked in. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> hey, I love that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Sorry, I um, don't have the raise hand button, but I do have a question. Okay, hi, Nicole. Hi. hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can make sense of my thoughts. Um, you know, things, I really, it helps to hear your teaching about how things have gotten a little weird <laughs> um, because I've basically had my, my routine hasn't really changed since the pandemic began. You know, some people have gone back to work and had that variability, but I've just been uh, at my home in my space um, working and, and going to school, but still very much, you know, at home. And um, it's brought up a lot for me in terms of my relationship to home and to and into that sort of retreating from the world. Um, I think my question is about how to, you know, on a practical level, when to say, okay, it's time to go for a walk, which you talk about, Michelle, or, you know, I think I, I resist going out into nature, which is really the thing that would restore me. And, and sometimes when I'm in my own home space, um, You know, and actually here in, in September with Ida, we had a big flood in the basement. And so that's also sort of changed the relationship. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I, I'm just very, I'm like in an intimate relationship with my home that's gotten a little weird. And I'm just trying to figure out how to like daily, maybe a daily practice of walking or just suggestions about that would be really Do you have, um, Steve also, Steve, I know you'll have suggestions, but I'm just, what comes to mind initially is, um, is there a time of day where it's easier for you to get yourself out? I think right when I wake up, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I really think these are things you really have to pay attention to. Um, you know, in some ways where I live for right now, it's like, if I don't go out right away, um, it's so, uh, it's going to sound funny in the winter, but I live in the desert and it's so hot and sunny. I can't, I can't actually go out until like it gets almost dark, right? It's just too much. So it, I'm from New England initially, originally, and it's so, it's still sort of foreign to me that at one o'clock in the afternoon, forget it. Like I, I, you know, just too much, but it's sort of, it's an, um, kind of a forced discipline that 
I'll hear somebody's going for a walk at 10 o'clock and I'll be like, you know, not, not where I live, but it's just like, oh, that actually happens, right? And um, so, but I know for myself that um, anything that I find difficult to do, I try to do it when it's the easiest for me. So you might, I don't know what else can, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm the type also that, tries to make something fun if it's difficult. So again, I don't know exactly where you live. Like, oh, I know, because I'm, I'm, you know, I have a phys physical injury and I'm supposed to, um, <laughs> I'm supposed to go in the water and do this bicycling thing or hanging and I don't like it. I really don't like it. Just getting across, I don't like it. Um, I hate it. And uh, I've like, <laughs> There's these little buoys in the water. And um, if I manage to get myself there and to do it, I've started like, I'll, instead of doing the bicycling, I swim to the buoy and then I go around it bicycling and then I swim to another buoy. And I, do you see what I mean? I try to make something fun for me within the, that I don't like it. Does that make sense? So I don't know where you live, like, you know, if you were in Italy, you'd go to the coffee shop and you'd go buy some tomatoes and you know what I mean. I'm not kidding. You know, you'd, you'd sort of try to make it fun. Um, I don't know, Steve, do you have any other suggestions? Because I think making something, uh, the easier you can make it and the more interesting and the more um, rewards, you can also get a reward when you come back. That's one of my favorite things to do. It, I guess I'm not sure if you guys are all listening, but it's really important. If you don't like something and you're being told you, or you feel like you need to do it, then it's like, um, if you like smoothies, you'd make a smoothie when you get back, or if you like coffee or tea, you know, like that's all part of the, um, a cookie. <laughs> Steve would have ice cream. <laughs> See, what do you think? It's understandable, Nicole, that you would feel the way you feel under these bizarre circumstances. I've never, been, I've never been in one place for so long, as long as I can remember. So the, the house for me has become like second skin. And so, if I get it out into the yard, that's a pretty big deal. And then I keep little projects going, little places where I try and grow strawberries or this and that. And it's a, a repeat process because there's chickens in the garden here, chickens and children, and things get uh, dug up really easily by soccer balls and, and chicken beaks and this and that. So I always have to do the same thing over again. It's like a ritual. I plant, I peel off the skin of a strawberry. That's where the seeds are. And I'll, I'll try and get them uh, wet on a paper towel and get them sprouting. And then I'll carefully lay them in the dirt and cover them over. And I'll try to keep them eye out. But the chickens do what they do whenever they want to do it. <laughs> And the, the next thing I'll do is I'll walk across the street and go down to the ocean. That's not so far. And then when, once I start feeling okay out, outside of the protective skin, then I'll take a longer, you know, I'll take an hour walk down to the cliffs or something like that and come back. And then I already feel good just doing that. I don't need ice cream. That's the reward. <laughs> but the short little things until then, then yeah, I'll make a smoothie or I'll reward myself in some way. Remember too that um, the journey is the goal. So whatever you're going through, the resistance or the little bit you do, which might be less than the day before, but more than the next day, that's the point. That's it, and that's enough. 
you know, just to, uh, that's what I can do now and to completely accept that and feel that and, and go through the feelings of resistance or the feelings of, I'd rather just, you know, curl up and put the blanket on and stay in my skin. If we really accept that and really understand that, like if we really understand the need for our second skin, we can step out for longer and longer moments at a time. So your aim is to understand, not to do. Yeah, I'm actually really glad you mentioned what you br what you brought up because I do think most people are experiencing things as odd. I think that there's sort of a a healthy timelessness and then a kind of odd timelessness that's happened with the pandemic. And I think there's an the odd one can be um, unsettling at times really unsettling. So uh, the only I have one other thing that I thought of, which is sometimes um, but it, it is it isn't winter here, but where I live, there's not much um, <laughs> you could say alive in certain ways. But um, there's a copper dragonfly that sometimes comes by me when I walk up the hill and uh, I look forward to saying hi to the copper dragonfly, but I know wherever I've lived, like when I was um, visiting Steve and used to live there, you know, there's there's a house that has Christmas lights that I remember there since 1983. And, and um, they, what I really think is funny, Steve and I walked by there and it's the same bow. They put the same bow on their door that they have every year since 1983 and it's kind of faded. And it's really fun. Like these things are very simple, but I just, I took, I just love that the way they decorate their place and you say hi to it. I don't know them, but it was like a goal of where to walk to, not too far. And I think these little things, like if it, if it was a certain, there's really not a tree here that really stands out. I'd walk to a tree, but do you know what I mean? There's, there's things to kind of check out or homes or um, people. I had grumpy neighbors go by me today. <laughs> You know, you just sort of notice things. <laughs> Great. Hamsa? I don't know who. Oh, wow. All of a sudden there's hands. I don't know who was first. Was it Hamsa? Hamsa? Or Kathleen? Steve, did you notice? I did not notice. Yeah, all of a sudden. I, I was going to just add something. Also, uh, uh, Hamsa. Hamsa, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, um, well, it's, uh, wow. I, I thought living in, in a temperate climate would be so much easier to be outside, but it's, because <laughs> I'm in Minnesota and, uh, and wow, I, Nicole, I can uh, really get how, what you're, what you're saying. I just kind of, um, we live a couple blocks from one of the lakes. We have a lot of lakes in uh, in Minneapolis and St. Mostly Minneapolis, but all over the state. Um, but it's really, really cold right now. And we have the, the snow. And um, what I have to do is just like put myself on automatic pilot. Like I, I stuff enough Kleenex. Or I know I'm gonna have to blow my nose several times when I walk around that lake. So a bunch of Kleenex in the left-hand pocket, the chapstick in the right-hand pocket, the earplugs because we're close to the airport, and get myself all bundled up. And what also helped me was uh, about a year ago, I made friends with uh, one of the trees around the lake. And then a couple months later, the tree said, well, come on, give me a name. So uh, its name is Shanti. And, um, and, and I feel its energy when I haven't uh, gotten down there for a couple of days, I, I hear it saying, Hey, you know, it's time to come and visit me. 
And that's really helped me a lot for like today, you know, I, it's really windy. Wow. I mean, really windy. And uh, so I got down there and hung out with Shanti for maybe about uh, in, uh, a couple minutes because the wind was just really blowing. And, and I've noticed that it's about a three mile walk around the lake. And when I first get down there, I kind of do what Harry does with, but I do the walking, you know, really getting into the walking, get my energy going. And then what really helps is then I'll practice um, metta. I'll practice the Brahma Viharas. And, and that really helps me. Just, uh, it's kind of like, it, it shifts me out of that, like, oh boy, this is so cold. What am I doing? This is crazy. And, and, and it shifts my whole energetic field. So that's what's helped me to, to especially if I find myself going, oh, I just don't want to, I don't want to do this. But then I get out there and there's a little bit of sun and feeling the air and smelling the air and knowing that Shanti's down there waiting for me. Um, and I'm halfway around the lake then. Mm. So I just wanted to share that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Metta. That's Metta, the tree. <laughs> Metta, yeah. And uh, again, I don't know who is next, Catalina or Kay, but I'll try Catalina and then and Kay. Then Kay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your wisdom. And uh, um, I have kind of a question. Um, I have um, several friends of mine in deep suffering and, um, and, and I don't feel like I, because I, I, I have peace, you know, the practice has given me a lot of peace so in a way I feel very privileged of, of having, I am a rich person. And having my friends um, being in such a much pain, and and I know, kind of like I don't, they don't allow me to give them a hand. Um, uh, so uh, it's a very odd because I, I feel like I, I I wish so much I can share share my piece share. <clears throat> uh, what I learn, uh, the, the, the talks that I hear, um, but I, I know that they are in their mind and there is no way that I can trespass their mind. Um, so in a way I, I have to be in acceptance of being them being in such a pain, so, so much pain. Um, I don't know if you, any suggestions about that, you know, like we, it's kind, like, kind of like it's a, a very egotistic practice of you be happy yourself and be in peace yourself and not really being able to, to, to share that with them. So that's my, 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 my question. Steve, do you want to go first? Sometimes the most powerful gift is is just to care. And if on some level they feel that caring energy from you, then they are receiving the gift. If they aren't able to, still there's not chaos around them. There's There's peace and care. And on some way, some level, that will help. So it's your discernment that's the uh, the second um, factor of awakening. Investigation means discernment. It's investigating what's happening in the moment and knowing what's the most skillful thing that you can do. Not what you should do or what you have to do or what this person needs to get, but just what is the most available offering possible right now? And so you discern the conditions and that person's receptability and 
where you are at that moment. And then out of that, you will know what to do. Because that same investigation or discernment is also another name for wisdom. The wisdom to do the right thing, the right amount at the right time. That's also compassion. Sometimes we don't know what that does, but it, I feel like um, with some friends I've seen over time that it might not be something that would ever be talked about or, um, that's not where they're at, but you know, they appreciate the energy. They might not even be able to say that, <laughs> but you know, over time they're receiving that energy and they usually, I think over time people really appreciate it, but it may be it's never spoken ever. Ultimately, an, an unconditional act of generosity, there's, there is no expectation. It doesn't matter whether they receive it or not. We just do it anyway. We, 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 don't, we know. don't know. They might, they might receive, receive it, it now, now or later. Or later. I'm, getting I'm getting a feedback. A feedback. I know. I know. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> the host, the host doesn't know how, know to, how to, to do about, to do about this. this. <laughs> That's an, That's an understanding. Okay. okay. I'll look, I'll at, look more. at more. Clear all feedback. How about that? Is that better? Wow. That was really cool. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Katalina. Good luck. <laughs> Hi. Hi, okay. everyone. Um, I think I'm opposite of Nicole, who kind of had to go out in the world <laughs> right that way. Um, and feeling the intensity of that physically and spiritually, both. And, um, and just oddness, like what Michelle, what you were saying of what we used to do and going back to it and how odd that is and um, and going to like a holiday-ish season, how um, people are more open and generous for sure and appreciating that and at the same time because of the oddness, I'm noticing a lot more of like, oh, kind of like, oh, that that really isn't generosity. <laughs> and, and really being able to not call it out, but just like be interested, like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Like, uh, why are you doing that? Or like, just, just being able to bring the investigation or just raise the question with as a curiosity with other people um and with humor for sure and that's that's so helpful and at the same time i feel like i i do pretty well in the moment with the person in front of me but then and learning that oh okay if i if i engage with financially oriented people this is what happens um and it's just illumination of it later becomes so intense that it really burns it feels like it burns my soul <laughs> to the ground um, um yeah and i'm finding and th those opportunities to just really have a connection with the resistance and um, maybe false generosity that that's that's there because I'm just out in the world. Um, 
and be so that the kind of burning out later happens more often and I'm just finding difficulty or I don't know I I feel like I feel oh okay it's it's one one side is it's great that I'm I'm be able to kind of relate to difficult thing with other folks in person and at the same time there are other parts that when I'm by myself there's a lot of illumination about it happening and not being able to really hold that in a way um well yeah. I think I think you described something really important which is that there's been so much um, almost being cloistered and then you go out and it's like um, you can't control other people's greed, right? Like I think that that's so painful that you, th especially when people think they're being kind or generous and it's actually motivated by greed and you, if you have an increasing sensitivity from practicing a lot, then th that's part of the price of getting more sensitized as you start feeling this stuff. And um, I think part of the practice is, is doing what you're doing, which is you come back to being quiet and you get to feel um, in some ways the aversion, the burning is the aversion to the green <laughs> and uh, you know ultimately you know the 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 equanimity gets you to see that it's not my greed or their greed it's just greed or my it's not my aversion or their aversion it's just aversion but it often takes hours for that to settle into that it's like being willing to burn is i think part of the practice it's like um the buddha called that the suffering that ends suffering it's the willingness to it's probably not just clear, oh, this is greed and this is aversion. It probably goes all over the place and with thoughts and um, hopefully you're remembering, sorry, <coughs> hopefully you're remembering some metta practice or compassion or, uh, you know, because the, ex the acceptance of our own greed and our own aversion is how we usually end up accepting others. And that it's, um, it comes from that daily practice or retreat practice where, you know how it is, we tend to resist wanting, we tend to resist, um, what is it called, uh, you know, the self, to, honest self-assessment, it's like you would wish for these people an honest self-assessment, right? And a, being able to, as Steve is saying, discern, investigate, and get to see the motivation because that's what this practice is all about. Um, you know, I know, I know on this trip that I just took, there was a man sitting next to me that wouldn't wear his mask on the airplane and everybody had a mask on but him, but he was like intensely, Bull, a very intense bully and, and I happened to be sitting next to this guy and I, I even asked to change my seat and they, the, the plane was full and this guy was big and he even before I even sat down he was mouthing off about all politicians and you know how awful masking is and it's like I'm like oh no <laughs> just what I need, right? My 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 roommate next to me the whole trip, and e even the whole I ended up somehow f following him through the airport because I was going the same way, and I I really looked around. There wasn't one person in the plane or in the whole airport that wasn't wearing a mask, and uh, it was so interesting to just watch um, how. Uh, how much aversion <laughs> there, there was, to, 
I still think of this guy, like, you know what I mean? Like I have the aversion and then I try to do the metta and the compassion, but that's how much it triggered for me. It was just, um, it felt so outrageous. And I asked the stewardess and the steward to do something and they were too afraid. They didn't, I asked them even after I said, why didn't you do something? And they're like, we didn't, we were too afraid. So when you look at like, well, should you confront somebody about their disingenuous generosity or, or, and then, or do you burn and um, get to come to this place where, look at this world. It's like why the Buddha taught. He chose to taught because of the greed, hatred, and delusion, and learning how to work with it inwardly and then outwardly. And um, I think the more that we are discerning, the more um, we have a powerful effect. It's like you might, again, it's like Catalina's question. It's like, we might not ever say something to somebody or we might, but over time, it's, it would be like how you relate to the greed. Because if you're not accepting it, if you're judging it, it, people don't change out of that place. I don't know, Steve, if you have more to say, but it's a very powerful question. It's like, how do we deal with all of this greed, hatred, and delusion? And one aspect of is, is accepting our own and working with our own and not getting caught in it. And I, I really see that the more I do that, the more I have an effect on other people. Steve, what do you think? I would leave it just like that. Just like that? Okay, great. Thank you. Takes a lot of metta, compassion, equanimity, wisdom. Well, these times are a test for our practice, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. I hope we see you next Sunday. Yeah, enjoy the holidays. Metta blessings for everyone. <laughs> Charlie, oh. Hi, Charlie. Next time, ask sooner about the closed caption. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Can't even say what people write. Oh, well, take care, everybody. I don't even know how to do this. Okay, I'm meeting for all.